Vicky and Fezia Tariq. We shall be moderating today's session. Uh, we are very, very pleased to inform you that the session is being conducted under the esteemed guidance of our very own Professor Vishajit Das, founding director at the, direct at the Center for Culture, Media, and Governance. With immense pleasure, I would like to invite our esteemed speaker, Dr. Kota Nilema. Before I move on to the details of the seminar, I would like to introduce our speaker for the day. Dr. Kota Nilima is an author, political scientist, and former journalist. She writes on poverty, gender, electoral reforms, and democratic deficit. Dr. Nilima was a senior research fellow at the School of Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins University, Washington, DC, and is an alumna of Jawaharlal Nehru University and University of Delhi. She is the director of the Institute of Perception Studies in New Delhi, and her initiative, Read the Debate, is the first and only content trading system of Indian media. During the second COVID wave, the Institute had campaigned for recognition of journalists as frontline warriors and maintains a database of journalists' death during the, during the COVID crisis. Dr. Nilima also advises our interventions to mainstream peripheries, especially on gender and rural urban distress. She has authored seven books ranging from poverty to spirituality. Her recent book, Vidhos of, uh, Vidhos of Vidharba, Making of Shadows, is a longitudinal study of farmer suicide households. Two of her books have been optioned for a web series, and one has been optioned for a movie. Uh, we thank you, ma'am, for joining uh, and uh, speaking uh, here today. Now I would request Ms. Fandari to briefly introduce a theme for our audience, following which I would request Dr. Nilima to kindly give a detailed presentation on the same topic for about 30 minutes. We shall take all the questions at the end of the session. So kindly write your questions uh, in the chat box, and Ms. Tariq will pass it on to our speaker. Following which, I would request Professor Bishri Das to uh, extend the concluding remarks and share his insights, followed by the vote of thanks by Ms. Siddiqui. Lastly, in order to maintain the decorum of the session, we have posted a few guidelines in the chat box for the participants. So uh, kindly adhere to them. Uh, that's it for me. Ms. Bhandari, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Shail. And good morning, everyone. Now, we are delighted to have Dr. Kota Nilima on board for today's session. And the topic, as we know, is pandemic precarity and journalistic labor. Over 500 journalists have died due to COVID uh, and related complications between 2020 and 2021. Most deaths have taken place in non-metro areas and majority among those without uh, government accreditation and recognition. Relief measures have been inadequate as center and state government are slow to recognize the labor of the journalists uh, who are reporting from the field to the all over India. And uh, the Institute of Perception Studies, New Delhi, has enabled the recognition of the journalist as COVID frontline warriors in 23 states in May 2021. So the campaign was based on the Institute methodological and uh, scientific inquiry into the professional, financial, and social conditions of journalists. And it is also the only organization in India uh, to quantitatively analyze the deaths to draw a few uh, conclusions. And most significantly, the findings reveal that the definition of journalist is based on a narrow scope of labor, specifically of a working government recognized accredited full time journalist. So this is an exclusive exclusivist uh, definition that removes the majority of journalists from uh, government or organizational responsibility and policy. But at this heart, at the heart of this exclusion, uh, however, is not just the structural inadequacy, but a reluctance based in systematic antipathy towards the nature of free media itself. On that note, I would like to invite for today. Over to you, ma'am. Good morning. Is my voice clear? My internet is not acting well today. Yes, ma'am. Extremely clear. Thank you so much, Professor Das, for inviting me uh, to speak on such an important topic. Thank you also for asking me to speak on this particular topic. Very, clear, very, very close to my heart. Journalistic labor, the way they have been covering the pandemic, the toll they have paid. Uh, I also want to give my special thanks to Shairi. I've been watching uh, your uh, career, your educational journey very closely. Thank you, Shweta, also for this wonderful introduction. 
Um, I don't know if I can stick to 30 minutes because as I said, our campaign has been so intense and it has been uh, about so many people and we have discovered so many things about journalists uh, which we thought were already decided, already clear, but then discovered so many of the structures to be uh, not true that um, I don't know if I can put it all in 30 minutes. Do stop me if I'm uh, overreaching. So uh, the pandemic, as I was saying, has revealed the fact that the governments have been unwilling to accept. Journalism is an essential service. Media has played a critical role in the fight against COVID. And yet it is only with great difficulty and after tremendous efforts by citizens that governments have given journalists the much deserved status of COVID frontline warriors. Now, why is this antipathy? What lies behind the reluctance of a democratic state to respect the role of media? This is an important study to understand the position of Indian media in the Indian polity and the perception about media among the Indian people. The pandemic has tested all structures of uh, Indian society and politics uh, for its resilience as well as efficiency. Many st such structures have proved, pro uh, which had proven to be sufficient before in peacetime, have failed in the face of the disastrous second wave especially. Most evident among the structural failures is public health, as we all know, and all aspects of it, especially policy, infrastructure, implementation, and administration. This failure has further, was further heightened because of the inherent flaws in the federal system, which allowed politics into matters of life and death. One example will sum up the public health crisis briefly because of the shortage of time. Till date, India does not have an accurate number of COVID dead from every village in the in this country. There is an official statistic which actually reveals the gross underreporting when compared to the accounts from the ground. And this flaw has let governments underplay numbers, a disservice to both the living as well as the dead. This is the most visible example of structural failures which have been led by, which have been because of the pandemic and what we believe were sufficient structures have been unable to match the pandemic. Uh, a similar structural failure was evident in media as well, and that is where uh, our research is focused. Over 530 journalists have died due to COVID and related complications between 2020 and 2021. This is the first and the second wave. Most deaths have taken place in non-metro areas and a majority were without government accreditation or recognition. And yet, there was initially little outrage, almost no outrage. Why? Because in the perception of the state, journalistic labor was merely something to be controlled and channeled. And in the perception of the citizen, journalists were merely reporting news, which could be partisan, which could be incomplete, and, and worse, which could be absolutely uh, dubious. So what is the source of this disbelief about journalistic labor? The answer lies in, a, in the lack of a well-defined structure surrounding media in India. Journalism has the, I mean, it does have a, uh, some structure. So let's define what exists right now. Journalism has two broadly, uh, two, two broad structures existing today. One is an operational structure or a structure for dealing with varied nature of news, which means how to cover a developing story, how to cover, uh, let's say, natural calamity. The second structure is a responsive structure, uh, which is developed to deal with managerial organizational pressures from in, uh, inside, as well as political and business pressures from outside. Both these structures were necessary for the functioning of the media and both have evolved into complex systems that accommodate a wide spectrum of aspects from uh, ethics all the way to post-truth. They do cover all that in some way or the other. However, Neither structures demarcate a journalist territorially as well as conceptually so as to safeguard and patrol that area with necessary guidelines. This has left journalists without an identity that can withstand interference and exploitation. Generations of media and democratic institutions did not establish a systematic structure of journalism in India. Media functioned in a per perceptional gray area for both the state as well as the citizen. And this was one of the significant reasons for the failure in, in uh, when journalists were covering pandemic in the second wave. 
the institute of perception studies has been tracking journalist deaths through uh, the second wave and also the first wave our research included not only publishing the latest numbers of journalist deaths but also collecting and collating related information about each journalist because this was the first time we had an opportunity to look beyond a uh, journalist as just a, a notebook or a pen or a camera or a mic but also look at the person who is uh, you know involved in the pandemic i mean this is an extension every journalist is also an extension of of the event uh, he or she is covering so uh, as i was saying this gave us a great amount of insight into the profile of journalists who died their families the kind of work they were doing and also how they were exposed to the pandemic a very interesting finding was also to talk to the families of journalists who had died look at their own perception about what they thought about uh, you know what the journalist was doing about the risk they were taking it was it was interesting to see how they were uh, um, uh, dealing with the idea of freedom of press freedom of expression and the right to information of the audience or or the viewer or the reader i'd love to go into the details of our finding when we if you get any questions on that uh, if you can just briefly run the slides for uh, to to just give an overview of our so there are just 6 uh, to 8 slides <coughs> thanks um, ma'am tell me when to uh, switch to the next slide sure so <clears throat> the institute of perception studies uh, uh, we research as i was saying uh, our main area of focus is perception and how it it evolves the power in society in politics in various aspects our uh, uh, main, uh, main areas fields of research are poverty gender farmers democratic deficit of all kinds as well as rural and urban reforms uh, it has been my endeavor as the director of this institute to keep our focus squarely on reforms in all on fields and that was the reason behind the media initiative of uh, ips which is rate the debate at rate the debate we, our focus is mainly and squarely on what reforms can be brought into seemingly unreformable areas like television debates uh, or or anchor conduct so we try to get into those uh, uh, difficult places and try to see what we can do methodologically through a scientific methodology and way where we can have evidence based on which we can uh, suggest or uh, think of some reforms next slide so this re research report is on journalist deaths between april 1st 2022 june 9th 2021 next slide <coughs> this is roughly to give you an idea about the intensity of the problem um as you can see the numbers on the on the left side of the screen show that between april 2020 to 21 310 deaths in uh, between 2020 april to december 2020 57 that's last year and this year itself between april 1st 2021 to may 31st 2021 229 journalists deaths because of covid now on the right side you would see a, a graph the small little graph uh, bar on the on the left side is the number of deaths per 10 days that's just one death per 10 days of april to december last year okay and that has risen to 37 in just april to may so that's 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 again you know the numbers don't tell the story but that's 37 journalists who have died after covering pandemic in between uh, in the months of april and may this year and may just in june next please this is generally the the way the crisis has been increasing as you can see more or less till december between april to december 2020 uh, there has been there was a decline there was a peak and there was a decline but you can see the steep increase from january february 2021 till may now again we are seeing a little bit of stability and fortunately the numbers don't seem to be rising but that is also a reflection of the general you know decline in covid intensity across the country um 
So as, as you can see, the journalist's deaths are extremely sensitive to the kind of conditions across the country. So in case uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic is raging, if the intensity is very high, even the journalist deaths are increasing. So therefore, there is no protection. That's what I'm trying to say, that there is nothing to protect, uh, I guess, the journalist from uh, the situation on the ground. Um, next slide. This is a, a comparative uh, graph of various states. And as you can see, in a very counterintuitive way, Uttar Pradesh is not at number one, which to us has been quite uh, confounding because our understanding of rural Uttar Pradesh has been that the uh, both the uh, normal as well as journalist deaths have been very high. Point with, it, uh, with several states is the issue of reportage of members. The numbers are not being reported as well as they should. So we expect some states to look much worse, unfortunately, than they are looking on this graph. And the states which are looking bad, like Andhra Pradesh, are probably looking this way simply because there is better reportage of numbers. There is a there is more communication and uh, understanding. Uh, the green parts are the unverified deaths. That simply means that we know they are COVID uh, um, deaths. However, our methodological or the scientific process we follow includes gathering of information from the families and several other measures. So we are in the process of doing that. Uh, I can explain again our methodology in detail if there is a question later on, because uh, I'd love to talk about how we go about this. Next slide. Please. This is age-wise journalist deaths. We mapped what are the age groups in which the deaths were the maximum. And as you can see, the maximum was in the age group of 41 and 50. Uh, the initial premise we had when going into this analysis was that probably we'll have the highest number of deaths in the younger groups. Uh, but that was not so. The maximum deaths were between 41 and 50, followed actually by 61 and 70, and then followed by 51 and 60. Uh, in fact, 31 and 40 year old journalists are just 17% of the total deaths. Next slide. These are the media categories. Again, I can speak more about any of these slides later on in the questions or if somebody wants to discuss. But the media categories are extremely important because 57% of all journalists who die are from print media. Once again, the concept that uh, you know the print media is not on the field or is, uh, these structures are all wrong. Uh, the deaths show that the pandemic was being covered right face to face by the print media. Face to face. That's exactly why the toll was so high. Uh, next slide. This is the last slide where I wanted to bring an important point. The green dots are the non-metro areas where the deaths have taken place. And the red dots are the metro area. Now, the metro and non-metro areas, we have taken the definitions given by the government of India. Uh, where they talk about semi-rural, semi-urban, all th those come under the non-metro and the metro are the cities. And as you can see, 69% of the deaths occurred in non-metro areas. And we'll come to that in my uh, talk, why is there um, this level of differentiation? But in case any other questions, I'd be happy to answer at the end of the, at the, end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for the slide. So let me just give a very brief outline of the findings. Approximately four journalists deaths per day in April and May 2021. Majority of deaths in metro, non-metro. Most deaths in print uh, and in the age group of 41 and 50. Majority of deaths of those who were unaccredited or not recognized by the government. Majority of deaths were those who were the primary providers for their families. And 85% of the deaths are among journalists who are married with or without dependents. Now, in view of these findings and the increasing deaths, we uh, the Institute decided to seek relief measures from the government, uh, both governments, both at the states and center. Some of our efforts and some of our requests were, first, we wrote letters to all state governments asking journalists to be made frontline warriors. Following this, 23 states uh, gave journalists their status. This was a necessary recognition in my mind.
to give journalists the kind of respect and i guess recognition for the kind of work they were doing number 2 every state was requested to facilitate vaccinations for media following this most states have now ensured media is provided vaccinations on priority number 3 keeping in view the financial situation of journalists and the massive hospital bills that the families had incurred dealing with covid uh, we have asked the governments to provide financial support this is now this is now a relief provided by almost all state governments at varying degrees number 4 we wrote to the central government asking that journalists should be given status of frontline warriors which is yet to come about and priority vaccination which is happening as well as financial support as our battle with the administrations continued it was evident that the delay or absence of relief measures for journalists was not merely an operational oversight because we thought there was the all administrations state center everyone was under so much pressure dealing with pandemic maybe that is the reason why they were not quick in responding to journalist deaths that was our premise increasingly however it became clear that the reasons were different from what we thought at first there were predominantly four trends we discovered while dealing with governments on journalist deaths number 1 journalistic labor was not accepted as an essential service even when the media was bringing news about the dead and dying and the critical shortages two there was a functional resistance towards facts being reported from the ground from hospitals icu wards cremation grounds and families of the affected number 3 pandemic news coverage of the crisis was regarded as anti government activity and the more accurate the picture the more intense the hostility towards the journalists for and last journalism was largely seen as presenting a negative picture about the pandemic and had an adverse impact on citizens perception about governments to sum up our experience with the government governments were unsympathetic towards journalist deaths because the media was doing its job of reporting the facts this was ironic because the citizens were indifferent to journalists deaths because they held the media responsible for not doing its job very well eventually however we succeeded in getting several measures accepted by different governments over a short period of 2 months i am also happy to note that a large number of journalists are now getting vaccinated through special drives but a few critical elements still remain so that we are not in the same position ever again a set of guidelines are necessary to ensure free medical aid to journalists and support the families who have died for this the institute has moved the supreme court uh, seeking directions to the government how does our work and our research inform the future theoretically two findings were most significant one the definition of journalists is based on a very narrow scope of labor specifically of a working a government recognized accredited full time journalist this is an exclusivist definition that removes a majority of journalists from government organizational responsibility and policy two there was an antipathy towards free media which in turn forced journalists to choose bias and 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 to survive under temporary patronage of either politics or business The first finding of research can be addressed through a structural reform. Do we, how do we reform the definition of a journalist? All journalists are not equal. That has to be first uh, made clear. The government recognition of journalists happens through accreditation, and that's why they are not all equal. A, this is a process by which a media person from a registered media organization is accepted officially. This helps in the dissemination of news from the state. to the media by a valid uh, verified reliable channels for the citizens such accreditation points to credibility and factual accuracy of the news it's easy for the citizens to believe something or at least so we believe when it comes from these channels these formal channels therefore are crucial for state communication in theory this works well in practice however accreditation lets governments differentiate among publications as well as among journalists at times even personal equations with the official machinery plays a role further the government recognition allows access to official information official premises and official events therefore the government gets to choose who does and who does not get such access 
Additionally, it must be noted that the rules of providing accreditation leave out those with smaller circulations. This selection process is unfairly tilted towards organizations that reach larger audience and therefore have corporate backing and investments. This selection process also creates a nexus between advertisers and media organizations based on validation from the state. Also, not all news is urban. There are a large number of small and medium level journalists who provide crucial news from rural and semi-urban areas of India. Accreditation is tilted against rural publications and reporters, even though rural communication may be the very backbone of any state's development. The solution to this would be to provide automatic accreditation, of course, with a few serious strict rules. For instance, any journalist who has spent a stipulated amount of time in the profession should get an accreditation automatically. And that time should not be what it says right now in the accreditation guidelines, but should be a reasonable time limit like one or two years. Also, accreditation to non-urban journalists must provide special assistance like free travel, free medical aid and free access to internet, which is so crucial for them to report about the villages. The second finding of research can be addressed through a conceptual reform. How do we address the antipathy towards media? Acceptance of democracy is meaningless without the acceptance of free media. And there is a consistent confusion between tolerance of a free media with support to free media. These two terms are constantly confused between. Every crisis has revealed this difference in our country. The difference between tolerance and support of free media. Media often is valued only when it is supportive of politics, uh, people in politics or in powerful positions. Instead, media has to be valued on the way it represents common people. And the more people, uh, and the more people and their issues that it represents, media should be considered more free. The complementary coverage of politicians and government reveals that the media houses find it rewarding. It is not about good TRPs and good circulation figures. After all, there is no mechanism to know what the viewers would like to see or what a reader would like to read. Among the given menu of issues and people, the audience responds favorably towards some. It is not to say that the audience will not choose better if they had better options. Poverty, hunger, disease, starvation, drought. These are problems that are rampant in rural India but find proportionally very little space in our headlines. Every urban Indian was in some generation a rural Indian. There is an invariable interest in these chronic problems of rural India and also in, in an interest in solving them, but only if the media plays the role of a critical catalyst in this development. So the con conceptual reform is a solution to this, as a solution to this, is must come from the citizens who may not choose to watch a channel or read a newspaper that dedicates top news headlines to powerful only. They may choose instead to communicate to their ch television channels or print media what they would like to see. It can be used to rank media. There can be a methodology behind this uh, to see how much of people issues have been covered or not covered and what do people think about it. So in view of these two possible reforms, I shall conclude therefore on a hopeful note. Media by nature is very sensitive to public perception. And public too is very perceptive of the media. To leave media in a structureless, informal space only helps the state that lacks respect for democratic participation. Therefore, the reform of media is a service to citizens of this country and the pandemic proves it can wait no longer. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was a wonderful presentation. I hope I kept to the time limit. <laughs> Absolutely, ma'am, you are in time. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with the first question. Sure. Uh, it's from Shalu. Uh, she asks, it's, is, the metro, uh, is it the metro regions facilitation which prevented the death of journalists as compared to the non-metro regions or there are other reasons too? Well, the uh, reasons for higher non-metro deaths is, of course, the amount, uh, the, the, the density of the population, which is metro and non-metro in this country. I mean, that is number one. Statistically, I must say, methodologically, when you're looking at the framework of uh, population segment, it is this. The second is that the uh, health services. The health services are 
much more uh, evolved in um, metro areas. So even journalists were able to reach uh, medical facilities in time. The facilitation, as she said, would I would say is the health, <coughs> the health and the infrastructure facilitation. But the one facilitation which I would like to add is the government recognition. As I was saying, a lot of these journalists, uh, especially in the metro areas, are recognized by the government, <coughs> which is uh, to them it is necessary because they are doing the job of also covering administration, government. So they need the accreditation to have access to the state. Then state doesn't give access unless it recognizes you. And by that, this, that's what the, uh, you know, the another, another word for facilitation is the state facilitation, where the state facilitates only those which it wants to access it, right? Chooses. So um, that's also one of the reasons because there is a higher degree of invisibility of the non-metro journalists when compared to the metro journalists. So there is that. I hope that answers the question. Uh, absolutely, ma'am. Uh, we shall move to the next question. It's from Preeksha. Uh, she asked, the fact that journalists aren't recognized as frontline workers, does this show the apathy more on the part of the government or the representative organization of these journalists? So uh, the status of a COVID frontline war warrior is given by the government. Why does that? Because then you, uh, then the person or the uh, the group can get priority in vaccinations and other uh, advantages, so that they are doing their duty to the best of their ability during pandemic times. That's that's what the uh, that's what the term should mean. Um, therefore, the primary responsibility of giving that status to any segment of the population lies with the government. Yes, the organizations should have and might have pushed that this, this status should be given. But for that, again, you know, we are looking at the organizational structure of journalists, of medias, not being designed with the journalists at the middle of it. They are always designed with revenue or survival at the middle of it because the uh, no media organization uh, can look beyond, you know, uh, their own survival. We all know they are in a, they are not in a very healthy position right now. So because of that kind of focus, I must say that that is the reason why media organizations do not have the kind of power they should have in exerting that influence on the state to take measures which could have saved journalists. Um, once again, I want to say that the reason why the, they do not have the influence is because of the lack of focus on individual journalists and the focus on the larger survival of the organization itself, which, which of course is important, but the pandemic exposes that every life matters, every journalist matters, and uh, I hope the media organizations also realize this. Uh, Ma'am, as far as you've... Uh stated right now, can we say that this is the reason why um, the journalists um, have been delayed with the accreditation? It or is possible. Uh, as I said, it's not as, it's not, it's not only from the side of the media organization. Although you are right, there is, there is a, there is a selection process on that side as well. See, it's as simple as this, that if you have a very narrow number of, let's say seats or uh, number of uh, accreditations to be given out, and only the state decides. If you see the accreditation guidelines, there is a committee which decides on who should and should not get accreditation and the rules are quite strict. So uh, even when the, even on the committee, the people on the committee are, should be those, some of them can be journalists, but those who qualify for accreditation, right? So uh, let's say a non-accredited journalist would never make it to the committee, right? Uh, especially if that he or she is not qualified. So the qualifications are to be fulfilled by the media organizations. They themselves have will have uh, uh, a tough time matching up the guidelines. And the second thing is they also now can choose who among them can get accreditation or not. Similarly, the government can decide which media organization, which journalist can get access to 
uh, their uh, their communications, their offices, you know, the the kind of information that they give out. So, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, the next question uh, is from uh, Mohammad Asif, and he asks, uh, "Does your study include freelance journalists, and how did you choose them? If yes, how will they get benefited?" I know that has been one of the most, um, I think, one of the most touching aspect of our uh, research: how to include freelance journalists, and why do I say? It? I mean, we we were at one point uh, thinking this was the most important part of the research because. as uh, the earlier questioner had pointed out urban metro journalists were very well uh, visible both to the state to the citizens they were known the rural journalists did not have um, that level of visibility they did not ha all have accreditation um, they their facilities were also very low but even among these the worst in terms of facilities or or visibility were the freelancers because whether urban or rural the freelancers were the worst hit we have about 10% of the total deaths are from freelance journalists and that number is very very low i know that number is very low it is has to be much more why because look at what is the what is the structure informal structure of news gathering in rural india it is not the way it is in urban india you don't have an organization what is the structure in urban india that we have an organization we have a set of journalists the organization sets the sends those journalists to a spot or assigns the particular news to be covered rural india doesn't work that way rural india works in inversely there are there is news happening these small level part time journalists who could be farmers who could be traders who could be anything who could be doing 100 other rural things they also work as journalists or news gatherers they bring that news sometimes in large numbers you know they may bring four or five or 10 uh, points to the to a particular journalist who might be employed with uh, uh, an organization as a freelancer the so the uh, the information then comes to a freelancer the freelancer then has to investigate as much as he or she can to then report it to a regular journalist who then takes the help of all these to finally uh, report the news but my point is no urban or uh, urban journalist or a non metro journalist can directly go uh, without the help for instance of uh, of the rural journalist will never have that uh, information pipeline uh, you know cannot it cannot happen i mean any journalist will confirm this so uh, this being the case the invisibility of the lower level or the lower rung of journalists in this in this information communication pipeline is disastrous it's inhuman because a large number of people who jo zameen se itne closely jude hue hain they do not have any recognition at all i mean they they are the people who are reporting about their community that is the true form of democracy and free media if you ask me but they do not have any chance of getting accreditation they are not even recognized as freelancers okay so yeah that that has that remains an an open area of research for me i would love to do something on this we are working on something to um, develop a database of rural reporters across india so uh, these are of course those who are still employed from them we then will get information about freelance journalists who are working in reporting on rural india and then go down to even stringers or those who are giving smaller bits of information to this so it it looks uh, a long project but we will be doing this um over to the next question ma'am uh, by priksha uh, she asked who is called a journalist by profession uh, is based on qualification or work no formal recognition of the number of practicing journalism is journalist is there can such a recognition increase their rights and lobbying okay uh, that's an important question because uh, that is one of our uh, findings for reforms um, because as i was saying a structural reform is necessary to understand who is a journalist uh, that in that definition interestingly has been very narrow in a country as democratic as this uh, so that has been a matter of worry for me so why do we not have a wider definition of journalists why do we not have a, a structure which is which protects them so i i totally agree with what she is saying that there there can be benefits to 
benefits in terms of just freedom you know uh, to journalists as well as citizens if there are more and more journalists in the uh, in the system who are recognized as journalists who have the who have the duty of reporting news i mean that also means who have a chance of being employed who have a chance of making uh, some you know professional career out of it but as i was saying the the basic structural reform we need to bring is to is in the definition of journalist himself or herself and that cannot be and that is something which the pandemic proves uh, unfortunately after paying a very severe price is that the present structure which is based on validation of the state of the government cannot be the only definition of journalists okay ma'am uh, so the next question uh, is from uh, shalu again uh, she asks about the strangers who are not just covering the news but also uh, is indulged in other news media work such as uh, gathering advertisement looking for paid news they are forced to do all the rounder jobs in that space yeah so um very 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 important part of uh, you know the communication network in our country are the stringers and um, i must say that some of the best news for instance any news actually in fact any coverage of rural india is not possible without uh, without the stringers i in my own experience and i was a journalist for more than a decade and uh, with a with a major newspaper and i have always felt that uh, without a without a, a stringer or sometimes more than one actually two or three uh, we would not get the accurate number of let's say you know the people or whatever the numbers some people are so passionate they are stringers simply because they want to put out the put the truth out there you know so they would do their own research the second thing is photographs the photographs from rural india believe me most of the times come from informal stringers they are not they don't come from professional um, or or well known uh, you know photographers uh, the third thing is when you are actually looking that's what i was saying that the true form i guess of free media uh, the essential form of free media where the bias is also very less uh, i think the bias also increases uh, from the stringers all the way top to the best anchor so if you see the i mean i don't believe in hierarchies and i do not believe in pyramidal structures but if you had a pyramidal structure where where the At the, at the top of a pyramid was an anchor. At the bottom were all the stringers. I would say the bias absolutely increases from the stringer, where it would be let us say zero, to the anchor where it would be hundred percent. So that's the way it works. So I think the stringers are the freest and the most unbiased elements of Indian journalism, and also the most unsung. Now the question to be asked is: Is that why they are unsung? Because they do not have bias. now that's something again which has to be conceptually un- understood first uh, as a structure that does it is it does it become necessary that as you grow more and more representative more and more influential the journalist has to have has to take sides to survive is that what it is that perhaps you know a, a stringer or a freelancer can remain free simply mainly because they are not uh, you know uh, they are not packing as much of power as i guess the higher um, as we go the more senior journalists and the more you have the power to attack maybe you need the power to defend to defend yourself defend yourself defend yourself you have to take sides they have to take patronage of politics or business or corporate houses or organizational support just to survive and tell the truth because they are taking on very powerful things now that's where the failure of the structure comes that's what i also mentioned in my talk that the reason why they have to take the patronage inside or outside their organizations um, and therefore fall into the traps of bias is because there is no inherent structure which protects them if they were originally a structure which had evolved over a period of time with a very wide range of guidelines which covered every aspect of journalism we would have not needed this kind of uh, 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 you know patronage or support and we would have known see this is the this is another big problem that when i look at uh, you know young students looking at media what is your point of reference of free media there isn't none because the uh, the only ways you can do that is by selecting one bias or the other so you do not you do not actually 
uh, see the idea of free media being widely, widely, popularly being projected. See, that's why I'm saying the real, to me, the real free media exists at very close to the ground. So that is the millions of thousands of stringers and freelancers. So it's like a grassland, you know, with lots and lots of expressions rather than a tree, you know, where at the top we have these celebrity anchors and journalists and everybody is feeding the, feeding the uh, you know, the particular um, spectrum of, you know, great men and women. No, I, I rather prefer the grassland where, which has millions and millions of, uh, you know, freelancers who are giving you out news and luckily we are able to access it through digital media and social media. And it wasn't happening before. So these are some of the thoughts which we need to explore further, I guess. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, so the next uh, question uh, is from uh, Vibham Shukla. Uh, he asked, uh, is it really the right to, uh, right to expression if any minister's written work is placed on the editorial page of a newspaper? <laughs> well, I mean... Uh, Right to expression is only valuable, or rather, let us put it this way, right to expression is only a right to expression if everybody is getting to express. Uh, if only some people are getting to express and, and others are having to quietly watch it, what would you call that? I would call it a promotion. I mean, I have no confusion in this. It's simple. If there are 10 people and only one person, opinion is being represented on the newspapers, I don't think so. The second, the second aspect which uh, which this um, this particular practice has brought to life is both sides of the story. Now uh, you might have heard of this particular controversy, or I don't know whether it should have been a controversy. I don't know whether it was a controversy or not, but it should have been. That both sides of a story are important. Are they? Are they important? I mean, when you let's say, for instance, talk about some a uh, um, uh, uh, child molester, are both sides of the story important? Uh, when you talk about, on the other hand, when you talk about a person wrongly arrested, then both sides of the story are important. How do we ethically separate the two? So, in the middle of all this, are, 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 are uh, people who are able to get their opinion out there without any struggle, without any problem, because they have all the, the, the commentary is an extension of their own continuous in uh, continuous visibility they are visible they are they are visible simply because they are they said to be representing all those who are invisible and therefore giving their comment on these pages but is that what happens do they really represent everyone they are um, so called you know people who are not able to represent themselves i do not believe so number one as i was saying when only certain voices are being promoted. That is not expression. I'm sorry. I have, a, I have a caveat to the freedom of expression idea. It's only when everyone gets to express, then it is a freedom of expression. If two people are talking and they are, uh, let's say, privileged, they are rich, they are, uh, you know, of a particular kind, then they are only representing their, their kind. I'm sorry, they are not representing the rest of the country. So there is a difference between, as I was saying, two points to be drawn from this. One, that this is no, nothing but, this is not an expression of uh, a right to expression. This is just a right to promotion. And the second thing is that the representative nature of these commentaries, I do not believe that they happen. And that, again, brings us to the two sides of the story thing. So in case they are saying something, they are saying X. Where is the voice which says Y? The other voice is not heard because these people are more visible. And I, I don't accept that, uh, that kind of freedom of expression. Um, so I would like everyone to raise their hands if they want to ask a question. Um, and uh, meanwhile, we just... Professor Das wants to ask. No, no, it's me. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nelima, for this uh, discussion. I just uh, wanted to ask being a student of media studies that don't you think that this whole all structural policy which we are discussing in the in the lecture 
regarding media professionals it's coming directly from our constitution because there is no special provision for uh, journalism or journalist and the press in the constitution so it's coming from there and uh, my second uh, question would be i would like to uh, share your observations or comments or uh, what do you think that at large journalism uh, is a profession or is it an occupation what is the larger perception within the media world as uh, you have interacted with lot of uh, media scholars or also practitioners so what is the uh, larger perception so these are my two questions ma'am if you could care to answer so no, thank you brilliant questions thank you brilliant questions firstly i would like to first say that uh, you know the idea of any constitution and i hope i am right uh, some of the constitutional experts agree with this what i'm going to say and some don't but i i like this version of it that constitution is an evolving document uh, it has to be an evolving document it has to uh, have a, a response to the youth the young of every nation it has to it has to have a response to the experience of the older generations unless that happens it becomes doctrinal it becomes stiff it doesn't work better than uh, any any book which uh, which is ancient or medieval i don't think there is any specific provision for the idea of just journalism or media but under the freedom of expression we have all this covered only problem is it is for us to redefine now that's my 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 fundamental issue with this great country for over so many decades we did not define media in this country that was the plan not everything can be written down what could have been written down was i think in the in the constitution the courts have been uh, i guess as active as they can be in uh, in defining whenever the issues came up but it is also the responsibility of organizations of thinkers of people who were deeply worried about the country to define media in a way that the media became robust independent strong and therefore free it could not, not everything can be derived uh, from the written word what was the other question did they i'm sorry Uh, Ma'am, I just wanted your comments and observation on the issue on the, whether, yeah, whether the journalism or is it a profession or an occupation? How do yeah. uh, uh, you consider it? Is it a profession or a because profession well, is always connected with like a medical profession? There is a very strong body of ethics yeah. or the law, which is which has a bar council of India. So yeah. journalism, I think, it's somewhere is at the. Uh, Uh, is in the blurred or the gray areas because for some it is a occupation those who are doing the freelance and uh, yeah, yeah. as on the social media and for some it is a serious profession so always the no, i agree see the lack of um, lack of structure is inherent to anything creative right uh, the moment you put a structure to something which is creative it uh, ceases to have the rigor and the and the and the energy which it has to have to be creative writing the art of literature that definitely cannot be under any structure i mean it, it is not possible i mean even if somebody tried but journalism is uh, famously said that journalism is a, is literature in a hurry and that's true it is literature in hurry but it is also the first draft of history right that's what it's also said journalism is also the first draft of history now when you are writing history or at least you are writing the first draft of history you better follow some rules <laughs> so um, cool it's good that you know it's it, right i mean as a journalist myself i have had to write stories with uh, 40 minutes to spare for the deadline uh, so and they were they were critical stories which went on page 1 so <laughs> i know that at that time you are thankful for your training you in your mind you thank that thank god all my seniors trained me in a way that i could i can sit down today and write uh, a story which is important and uh, crucial and factual in 30 minutes but at the same time when i want to write about let's say the how families are recovering from riots 
I want no structure there because I'd like to write exactly what they are feeling, what they are saying. And that has been the reason, uh, that's been the structure of my books and what I write about uh, farmer suicides, rural distress, several other issues. So there is a scope for both, but I don't think it's a gray area. It's, it's, a, it's simply an area which requires application of the rules which, are, which come from our constitution as well as the expectations which come from our citizens in an innovative way. Because if we do not structuralize this to some extent, or whatever extent creative pursuits can be structuralized, there will be no freedom of expression. That is where we are headed. And that is something which the pandemic so clearly, clearly defined for me. When I was fighting for journalists' deaths, it is the citizens who said that they are the ones who have led us to this spot. They are the ones who have not checked the governments, who were not investing in, in, in public health. So they were holding the journalists responsible and there was anger towards journalists. That's where you need a structure. You need structures so that journalists can and constantly address these issues. Right? Citizens definitely expect a structure from journalists that media should have a structure which is responsible. But journalists themselves, very difficult to structure them. I mean, ask me, I've been a journalist. So they, that's what I'm saying, that there has to be that level where you know you are doing your job and yet you are being creative. Every doctor, every engineer, let's take an architect. They may be following the rules of building everywhere, right? Okay, so you want to make a government building, there are certain rules to this. But they are also, everywhere there is also a creativity involved so you can be creative and also follow rules after all vaccines are being uh, are the biggest example of creativity if you ask me today so um it's not necessary that only the most anarchic situations can uh, lead to creativity creativity can happen in structures and it has to happen when you are talking about freedom of expression when we are talking about constitutional rights and when you're talking about aspirations of citizens of a democratic country, you have to talk about structures. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Priksha? Uh, Priksha, sorry. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I just wanted to ask you, so uh, as you were mentioning that, you know, there there is so much coverage that has happened. And uh, but the people hold the journalists accountable that uh, there has no they haven't uh, put the government on spot for uh, the health crisis that we're facing. So does this not say something about uh, the media consumption pattern in the country? Because we've got a lot of organizations that work on ground. For example, um, Peace Inats, uh, People Archive for Rural India or anybody else who's working on ground and bringing the facts out. But the people say that, you know, the coverage is not happening. And actually, we saw the coverage uh, deviate from the were unimportant. But on those news channels that we already understand are not practicing journalism. So don't you think that probably this, is, this again comes down, boils down to media literacy, the lack of understanding of uh, how to consume the right media in the country? Um, Preksha, great question again, because again, the idea of where to look for news, uh, um, where to look for news has been so simplified in our country. So what do you do when you need to look at news? You switch on the TV or you reach for the nearest newspaper or maybe these days you go on Twitter or Facebook or something or, you know, that's the, that's the main way in which we have been taught. This is the way to find news. Now, it is necessary that uh, alternative sources of news are uh, promoted. But how does, how does that happen? How did these channels, television, newspaper, social media, how did they become the primary suppliers of news? We should also analyze that. They became primary and suppliers because of their first mover advantage. Journalism is all about first movers. Nobody is a second mover. Because you get the news the fastest, the first, and the best, and the most accurate. Now, everything else follows that. I'm not saying that uh, it doesn't happen, but those that's the advantage. That's how you establish faith and trust in the mind of the consumer. That this is how news has to be, uh, this is where I can get this kind of news. 
Now, why is it that a predominant space on print, on, uh, on, on all your channels, as well as social media, a predominant space is occupied by rural news? Why is it that one person's resignation, okay, or one person's marriage in, in let's say, a nice, uh, sophisticated area dominates news for the next uh, uh, one or two days? As you correctly said, why is it so easy to divert attention from even the pandemic with other issues like, uh, you know, uh, elite issues like a blue take or something? Why is it so easy? So there is that that level of introspection has to happen. Yes, Pari, Sainaji, they are doing fantastic job. They've been doing fantastic job. But why isn't that mainstream? It's not because they are not. They have dedicated their life doing this. It's for the consumers to actually diversify. For them to diversify, it is no good to preach. It's no good to preach. Tell them that, okay, you shouldn't be doing this. You should be doing No. I, in my experience, I've heard that doesn't work. What works is prove that, look, you want to get, let's say, news from um, uh, Gorakhpur. This is where you go. You do, when, when you, so the top news, uh, digital channels, YouTubers, whoever is reporting about that. They should be there, and they, they should be the ones people should be able to go to, but only if you are getting that quality of news from them. So if I want to, let's say, uh, get news from Baroda. Now, I can't get news from Baroda because there's no news coming out of that. What do I do? So as a consumer, I'm highly literate about uh, uh, journalists and news, but I don't have sources. So there's necessity for the local communities also to start connecting and engaging with these major mainstream channels of communication, which is television, newspapers, and the digital media or the social media. Now, having said that, there's a huge uh, glass ceiling there when it comes to urban, rural, celebrity, non-celebrity news, which we all know. <laughs> and uh, it's not easily done. But at least you provide choice to the people. I mean, if they don't want to read about some cricketer marrying someone, at least they have a choice of reading about whether, you know, the farmers of a particular crop are doing well or are they dying. I mean, they at least have that choice. So I think that's where the important thing is, engaging with the channels. Absolutely essential. Thank you so much for raising this pertinent question, ma'am. The, the way you've actually you've, uh, made me think further that, yes, we have come at a point where uh, Twitter and social media, yeah. maybe these channels have become this primary source of news and somewhere this trend we we ignored this trend and now it's become the norm Thank and you. also nobody stops Priksha from uh, anyone in producing news see that's where I meant by the definition of the journalist the structural definition of journalist actually frees the journalist right it's a structure which which actually frees you because then anybody can produce news if you just know two or three four, things which you should, which you will learn even if you didn't know over a period of time. But because news or, or factual gathering isn't rocket science, thankfully. <laughs> so I think that's the thing. Uh, more and more communities and citizens must engage with the digital and the social media. I, I always thought of this thing that, you know, uh, people think of uh, media as uh, such an approachable profession that, you know, you don't need to be professionally trained for it. Anybody can step into it and take it. But the take that you've taken of how people can very easily step in and, you know, save it. Yeah. It's, it's yes. really fresh. Thank I, you. Think, I think one of the, one of the biggest uh, problems of governments since um, I think the last 10 years has been the mobile phone with the, uh, with the camera. I think that that has uh, uh, I think that has revolutionized democracy much more than any any single uh, Supreme Court judgment you can tell me because you know what has happened is that everybody has now a way of collecting factual evidence and in doing so they are actually being journalists they may not know that but they are being journalists you know and now here here comes the important part about being protecting them now that's where a structure is necessary that's what I was saying. That yes, you can raise a camera and take a video if you are not able to publish it anywhere. Or even if you are able to publish it, but then there is a big backlash, as we see very often these days. What is the protection? Why isn't there a protection? Now, this is 70 years of uh, free media in this country. So that was my point. 
that you know there should be something for the journalist to fall back upon thank you ma'am thank you you made it very well thank you uh, moving on to the next question uh, it's from eman um, and she asks if the conceptual change against the apathy towards media may continue from the public and at the same time the public is kept informed through the media then doesn't the onus of enlightening the common public regarding the same uh, fall on the journalist again or what else could be the way of achieving the realization in the public space uh, i i i didn't get it can you just uh, repeat the last part yes ma'am sure uh, it says uh, what else could be the way of achieving this realization in the public space uh, of uh, the kind of work journalists are doing i didn't get the ma'am she basically means uh, the conceptual change against the apathy towards media okay. that is yeah so uh, no i i think it's very easy it's one of the things which i have been hearing all my life and whenever i travel across the world everybody is also talking about the same thing that why aren't people you know it all depends on the people if the people don't want to see something like this they will say no so you know it, it it is true for hollywood it is true for bollywood if they don't want to see pictures movies where women are being objectified they will say no and then we'll stop making them this is the argument right but the real question is there is no feedback mechanism the conceptual change which i am talking about is that there has to be a feedback mechanism where they on on a constant basis the the viewers or the people who are uh, consuming news are commenting about it now they are just benign harmless consumers of news they have no power over the media or the uh, or the presenters or the anchors or, or anything so if that can be done it would be great we started i am like a, a, a one one particular you know uh, initiative which was called rate the debate ka part which is uh, to rate anchors so what we did and we have plans to make it a little more participatory after this what we did was to take five four or five metrics of a particular anchor like this did how much time did any anchor spend speaking on a uh, particular you know debate these prime time debates which we have where there is shouting there is you know everything happening so we said we'll take let's say 100 debates uh, and analyze them and see what happens actually because it looks absolutely chaotic but there has to be some thing so we said let's let's structuralize these debates we discovered that there are issues with the speaking time the anchors predominantly are constantly making the perception of the audience second there is also a restriction on anybody who is giving a contrary view so there may be 10 panelists but those two panelists who are saying no no you're wrong don't get time then interruptions and intimidation there is always a uh, pattern of interrupting anybody who is trying to make a point which again is against or going away from the perception you want to create so at the end of this we usually bring out a report card for each anchor why am i giving you this example is once we started making it simple of course it, it's not simple <laughs> when we were doing the research it was hardly simple but i'm saying that when we started putting it out in a simple way it was so nice to see people actually noticing these metrics in the debates for the first time so they would recommend why don't you do this particular episode because here your metric of let's say speaking time or number of interruptions are the maximum the people would come and tell us so it is as i was saying people are very very perceptive about the media they know what is happening it's just that they don't know how to methodologically approach it so if you provide them a method and if you provide them a way of ranking i'm i'm thinking that uh, we can bring about a, a very serious reform which is exactly what we are doing with read the debate it's a content ranking so we take the content of televisions and let not just us but we want to open it for the public to rank it based on metrics that's the thing So the last question of the day, uh, it's from Ayushman, and he takes us back to the uh, year 1918 during the outbreak of Spanish influenza. He asks, uh, he basically talks about the governments of uh, many European countries uh, then controlled the public opinion. Journalists were silenced, and most deaths were blamed on the World War. 
today on the other hand the government is denying journalists their rights in the midst of the pandemic not taking any responsibility for the infrastructural collapse of the health sector or the entire economy for that matter do you think this will ever change the story of stepaid voice thank you for that historical reference aishma i mean uh, another historical reference is the bengal famine so the bengal famine if you remember journalists were not allowed to and journalists those days were also freedom fighters and uh, journalists were not allowed to write about the bengal famine in the publications inside this country but luckily they were able to publish their articles in england where the english newspapers published stories of ground reports written by indians and uh, that's how the entire controversy began that's how the uh, the the government of that time was held responsible so no we are not uh, new to suppression but let me say this that if a journalist story or a voice doesn't face resistance then you are doing something wrong if you are being widely supported and widely applauded then perhaps you are a pr person to be very honest there has to be some disturbance somewhere because of what you have said because that's how true journalism is having said that as i come back to my point working in a structureless void the way indian journalists have still been able to call out governments has been fantastic has been fantastic and i must say that it it cuts beyond uh, any you know any any differentiations in journalists and they have been able to uh, talk about the failures of some of the most powerful people in this country and believe me standing on nothing nothing but a little space for them called freedom of expression in constitution that's all that's all they have to defend themselves so it has been a it's, a, it's been a phenomenal uh, success story of the kind of character of uh, indian journalists that they still been able to fight but my some humble submission is that it's not always easy for a journalist to fight uh, i am also from personal experience i can tell you that huge pressures apply on on basically people who want to tell the truth professionals who just want to do their job the people who love their country and that becomes very difficult for them to even do their job so that's my uh, hope that your generation especially takes the idea of reforms fights for them the moment you say media reforms people just say that what how how can we do it no it's not so difficult at all so i hope your your generation can bring the change we have been waiting for uh, definitely ma'am uh, thank you for the wonderful session ma'am uh, i will now invite professor biswajit das for the final concluding remarks over to you sir so your mic so your mic sir so your mic mic sir mic so your mic is off you will just be joining in a moment yeah Just switch on your mic, please. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Nilima, for such a brilliant lecture. In fact, you opened up ideas which are untouched, grey areas within the larger field of journalism education in this country. Unfortunately, journalism education does not exist. it's more about journalism training and if you want to make it journalism as an education 
probably you need to touch address these issues in the future years. I think I, I would also talk about specifically in a particular context, but I I just can't sum up because there are so many possibilities which you have opened up in terms of engagement, A, in terms of looking at structure and agency. Then also you talked about, um, you know, various, uh, you know, the, the, uh, there is a huge divide between metro and the uh, regional uh, context of journalism. In fact, my own experience uh, suggests that if you just get down from the metro, it's very difficult to find a journalist. And that's again a kind of a gray area. So what you have been talking about accreditation, even the reporters, even the kind of conditions in which the journalists or the reporters, suppose they work in the, the rural areas and try to provide as a stranger to the newspaper in the local context. So there is a lot of work in the future one needs to address uh, and also their their ways, their security, their life conditions. There are so many issues that overall, I just would like to say there are a couple of interesting observations. One is about, you mentioned about creativity, and also it is an important area to locate that can journalistic labor be called a creative labor? That's another important question, because in the future, people need to work on it, but in what way Journalist, journalistic labor can be considered as a creative labor. That is one side of the story. Besides, I think what we need to also engage in terms of, uh, you know, looking at this whole idea of uh, labor, and we have seen a kind of uh, witnessed a mass exodus of migrant workers due to COVID-19, while most of the media attention I mean, has rightly been focused on what you call the painful journeys undertaken by what you call the daily ways uh, earners who were employed in construction, small scale industries, and even the urban informal economy. I mean, another important uh, what you call um, slice of the urban workforce. I mean, they have received less attention. Um, the low end service worker also in the media sector I and mean, of course if you see the Fiki's uh, latest reports during the COVID-19 they would like to make a projection of what kind of media profession and labor in the future uh, because I, 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 I have my uh, I have my reservations about Fiki's uh, reports because they would like to provide a kind of a sense of projection of business but here I'm not interested in the business I'm talking about their conditions the living yes. conditions um, you know that informality and precarity what we have been talking about I mean have long characterized uh, labor across most sectors of the Indian economy I mean probably today you find even though what you call even prior to 1990s even post 90s that precarity continues across all sectors of labor I mean um, uh, I mean, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Workers, too, in media sectors are also extremely vulnerable. I and mean, my observations are purely from a very disciplinary uh, point of view. I mean, why we missed a labor perspective or orientation to understand journalism education? I mean, why we missed it? Because we completely believe, in, in fact, when you talked about, there is so much discussions going on here about democracy. In fact, in Indian context, news precedes democracy in India. If you look at a whole trajectory of 300 years, and we had a vibrant news, no matter whatever it is, but we had our news precedes democracy. That's why probably even those who championed, those who popularized, those who exported the idea of journalism and democracy, now they are running away. In fact, if you read Michael Sutson, who would say, why a journalist would like to have a democracy? I mean, interesting. Why you, a journalist would like to love a democracy? That's what they're saying. It means there is literally a link between journalism and democracy. It, journalism is no more a conduit. It has become an actor like any other actors. That's where 
the major shift which has occurred probably in those other things. Anyway, I just, uh, in fact, I remember the 300 years of, or 200 years of struggle on news itself could make it a kind of so-called independent media after 47, not like unlike your radio and television. And that cinema and newspaper were not touched by government. And only it is a radio. In fact, one of the policemen prior to 47, it's called John Coatman, who subsequently became the controller of BBC, financial controller. And he mentioned, never give the radio to their hands. And that we continue. That we continue. Till 1990s, after the Supreme Court judgment of what you call the uh, Postmaster General Act of 1885, that never hand over the um, spectrum. And this is where the question Hero Honda Cup cricket match in Kolkata, which really resulted in a confrontation and that really made now. Spectrum becomes a part of the commons. Everybody has rights to the spectrum, but which was protected what you call in, in the name of national interest and security and so on. And now that has been, I mean, that is another debate which we need to have it. Anyway, so my focus is that you know that institutional perspective of media has safeguarded what you call journalism in the media democracy nexus which is also obliterated the rank and files involved in the journalism production. I mean, press historians have concentrated primarily on the structure of the institution and its major forces, such as the importance of protecting content instead of addressing the issue of production in terms of labor and news workers. I mean, it has resulted in a very top-down history of the press that in fact privileged uh, what you call property and ownership at the expense of an understanding of media work or labor. I mean, as we know that the rise of the modern press in India coincided with what you call uh, with colonial industrialization policy and the emergence of the working class, I mean, which was strengthened by the flow of what you call the migration and the intensity of urbanization. I mean, yet job security and the protection of workers against sickness or unemployment remained an idea. I mean, it's a lofty one. I mean, newspapers embraced the push for industrialization as a path towards what we call economic progress and express the sentiments of what you call a business community in the post-independent period. I mean, once revenue and taxation was imposed like any other commodity, newspapers also witnessed the new structural patterns of industrialization in mergers and consolidations that resulted in what you call in part in a kind of a dwindling circulation figures and the collapse of what you call many newspapers that were in circulation in during the colonial period. I mean, the ownership displayed a conservative attitude, particularly toward the unionization of individualistic and poorly paid news workers, and attempts were rather um, under the terms of what called child labor laws to stop hiring of underage newsboys and so on. In fact, press as a place of employment, an environment of work, and a site of struggle over conditions of labor and ideas of freedom are of least attention. I mean, a history of media workers not only explains the nature and extent of industrial growth in, in, in the newspaper industry, but also defines progress in terms of human capital. I mean, that is the investment of labor, knowledge, and experience in the service of media ownership. I mean, media work, I mean, it focuses on the construction of realities and helps maintain the institutional power of the media. I mean, it involves the labor of journalists, among others, who are hired 
to perform to the expectations of their bosses and in the name of freedom of the press. The subsequent, I mean, confrontation between the kind of a lofty ideals and the need to make a living becomes an existential question. And the result reflects the pressures of industrial demands and the ability of individual journalists to compromise. I mean, their professional accomplishments are shaped by a permanent struggle uh, involving societal inequities, institutional barriers, and and the um, um, barriers, and even personal commitments. I mean, because the process of work is typically anonymous and disappears in the product itself. Yes. I mean, broadcasting sector too is not innocent enough. I mean, even now. We move to the broadcasting sector, it is not innocent enough. I mean, the colonial government proposed a policy of radio catering to what you call the urban, rural, and the labor exclusively uh, by early 1950s, right before independence. In fact, they wanted to have a labor radio. I mean, I mean this is part of my own research study. But, I mean, the intention behind the labor radio was to cater their day-to-day -day needs and queries. Probably, this was not the sense of urgency for the government in the post-independent India. It had other designs um, and marginalized a large section of workers belonging to a language-speaking community. In fact, if I recall case Dougal in his memoir, who writes about how the moment Hindi was introduced, a large section of people became illiterate in all in the radio. I mean, in his memoir that he talks about, I mean, a series of questions in the constituent assembly debates regarding the labor force in all India radio bears testimony. I mean, hence labor means belonging to a caste, an ethnic group, and a family to a gender. And emerging new journalism focused on a variety of news for a heterogeneous audience and more regular work, what you call reunites for newspaper men, news workers, and journalists, or whatever is their favorite term for an aspiring professional. There was a new breed uh, of writers for the 20th century who, who are quite different from the gentleman publicist and literate of most of the 19th century. I mean, media work focuses on the what you call the construction of realities and helps maintain the institutional power of the media. It involves the labor of journalists, among others, who are hired to perform to the expectations of their bosses and in the name of freedom of the press, the subsequent confrontation between lofty idols and the need to make a living becomes an existential question. And the results reflect the pressures of industrial demands and the ability of individual journalists to compromise. I mean, Andrew Otis, who writes, uh, 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 who provides a very pithy description, uh, what's called of untold story of uh, uh, the India in, in the India's first newspaper. On he has written a book on Hiki uh, that covers quite a lot of interesting insights. What I'm trying to say is. The strained relationship between the press and organized labor is a congenital condition that emerges in the anti-labor attitudes um, uh, of media ownership and is reinforced by a general lack of labor and union reporting, except in the sensational context of strikes. This antagonism is neither new nor surprising. I mean, as reported in the first press commission, uh, the All India Newspaper Editors um, um, Conference was interested only in the editorial aspect of the newspaper. On the contrary, the two other associations were concerned with the business aspects of the industry. Surprisingly, you see that newspapers were the members of these associations, but not individual members. And there were occasions where both associations uh, took joint action regarding fixing of minimum wages, 
for journalists. However, these recommendations were not mandatory. I mean, news reporting uh, sort of involved, uh, provided, sorry, news reporting provided the desire for an immediate result, that the era's what you call the mechanical capabilities and commercial opportunities helped to both foster and satisfy it. I mean, mechanical uh, mechanization of labor produced a division of labor in which reporters' work was often the least valued economically, even though it produced commercial credibility as part of the newspaper's selling point. Increased speed in newspaper production produced both a division of labor and specialization of labor in newspapers. I mean, reporters were but one widget in this mechanization, uh, mechanized process. And in spite of the stereotypes of spirited individualism and work, uh, freedom and the work life, as labor become more specialized, the reporter's work and the training for this work also emerge as specialized needs and activities. The issue of professionalism among reporters became more complex in as the control of value of journalistic work became increasingly economically determined. I mean, there is an obvious difference between a business and a profession. Uh, this is an implied intellectual creativity and superiority in this distinction between business and profession. The notions of which uh, often frame the debate of conferring professional status on newspaper reporters. It also raises one of the argument's paradoxes. I mean, we say that if indeed uh, journalism education was to professionalize newspaper uh, work by making its workers more efficient and the work more standardized, then where is the time and space left for individualistic creative endeavors i mean by reporters i mean professionalism allowed reporters to hamper improvements in their own work lives much more effectively than could publisher threats of policies uh, the trade union plan of organization is looked upon with some disfavor by most of the them and perhaps with some justice since I mean, it suggests that journalism is a trade rather than a profession. On the other hand, there is nothing in the trade union idea that should essentially uh, bar in you know, professional workers. What did not change during this time was that the work lives of newspaper reporters were still ones in which a living salary, a reasonable work hours, and a condition uh, job security and control over one's work remained a kind of an elusive work factors. I mean, reporters continued to be a replaceable, you can call it a cog, in the machinery of the modern newspaper. I mean, that is the lack of a labor perspective of media is also related to a more general neglect of media and communication histories of what you call the marginal groups whose experiences uh, uh, never acquired social or political weight and whose significance in terms of serving the need for any institutional biographies of power or that could therefore uh, consider minimal at best. I mean, a cultural media history, I mean, in that sense, requires a different look at the contemporary condition of journalism and demands a new sensitivity to expressions of cultural identity, I mean, while it examines various media uh, and their social uses, the writing of a cultural media history as a critical history, however, I mean, it exposes and reassesses the ruling assumptions of liberal pluralism and analyzes the relationship between state, journalism, and society. I mean, such a probably a research agenda is not only ambitious but difficult to operationalize in an increasingly conformist uh, um, educational and academic environment because it questions theoretical assumptions about freedom and democracy, 
and emphasizes the process of work and the place of labor. For instance, uh, the proximity of journalism education to media industries, coupled, uh, I mean, recently of late with a new sensitivity toward the demands of commerce and industry to implement practical courses and address professional concerns in university curricula may have created a real or imagined political climate that affects the practical commitment to any sustained and substantive discourse on labor and media ownership. There has been no major theoretical break and therefore no new historical narrative you see concerning the development of Indian media. While you see the dominant paradigm of media history continues to reproduce itself in biography and periodization and reinforces the currency of standard media histories, its practitioners operate within what you quote unquote a relatively insulated institutional framework. Uh, and noted that the resulting work rarely mean, meets or engages cultural studies in historical analysis. In fact, the traditional approach to media history is now becoming marginalized by a series of theoretical developments, including the work of culturalists. I mean, although the modern concerns regarding the contribution of marginalized group to the development of a journalism of gender, caste, ethnicity, in class and its role in society have found a voice, much needs to be done to reconstruct the history of communication in these communities. And the blind spot of Indian media history remains uh, uh, its uh, inability uh, in its uh, inability to uh, to uh, what to call ideologically uh, uh, and politically against a persisting and overwhelming feeling of, uh, of uh, homogeneity, wholeness, and a sense of singular purpose that permeates the general histories of Indian journalism. I mean, these efforts have successfully masked the historical conditions of diversity and reinforce problems of social and ethnic segregation by ignoring the potential strength of political journalism of multicultural interests. In fact, the political nature of labor history uh, 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 could lead to a giving the plight of minorities, including media workers, expressions beyond that could encourage critical support. The differences between political advocacy and cultural history become insignificant when both express uh, a common concern for recognizing the importance of people and groups as participants in the creation of history. Moreover, a cultural history of media workers provides the foundation for strategies of intervention in current media practices. I mean, finally, I would say a history of media work um, is crucial to an understanding of uh, the nature of professional practices, their changes, and therefore the possibilities among alternatives, uh, alternative forms of communication and journalism in society. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Das. That was brilliant. And, uh, you know, I totally agree. The history of media should inform, I think, the future of media. <laughs> and that's where we have to be. I also, I'm very deeply worried about, you know, what you, are, what you made me realize is that maybe the, the way, the, the blind spot, which we are thinking of right now, has been deliberately ignored. It has been deliberately constructed, perhaps. Uh, so this requires all kinds of uh, analysis and and uh, and study. Thank you for that uh, wide sweeping view of uh, you know where production, labor, and rights all are located in media. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well done, class. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Das. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now, uh, I think I would like to conclude this session with a vote of thanks. Uh, on behalf of us all, I would firstly like to thank our guest speaker, Dr. Kota Nilima. Uh, what an honor it was, ma'am, to host you and listen to your lecture. Uh, thank you, Professor Das. 
uh, for his unwavering guidance and support throughout this process and to the center of culture media and governance for organizing and hosting this lecture i would also like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the students of the center and the audience for their presence today hope you all had a lovely time thank you and have a great day ahead thank you thank you, thank you very much